Welcome everyone to this Federalist Society virtual event as this afternoon, February 28, 2022. We're having a book review and book discussion of a collection of essays called Unborn Human Life and Fundamental Rights, Leading Constitutional Cases Under Scrutiny. I'm Nick Marr, Assistant Director of Practice Groups here at the Federalist Society. As always, please note that expressions of opinion on our call today are those of our experts. We're very glad to be joined by two leading experts in this field, one of whom contributed an essay uh, to this essay collection. I'll introduce our moderator very briefly, and he'll take it from there. So we're joined today by Professor Robert P. George. He's the McCormick Professor of Jurisprudence at Princeton University. Uh, his longer bio can be found on our website. And without further ado, Professor George, thanks very much for being with us. I'll give the floor. Well, to thank you, you Nick. Uh, it's a pleasure to be uh, working with the Federalist Society uh, again, and a special uh, pleasure to be in conversation with my dear old friend, Professor Gerard Bradley of the University of uh, Notre Dame. Professor Bradley is one of our nation's preeminent scholars of uh, human rights and particularly of religious liberty. We're not going to be focused so much on the religious liberty uh, question today, but his human rights expertise is very relevant, of course, to the conversation we're having. Professor Bradley began his academic legal career at the University of uh, Illinois. Uh, before that, he was a uh, prosecutor, so he has some experience in criminal law uh, as well in his native uh, New York. He's a graduate of Cornell University and Cornell Law School. He was graduated with his JD from Cornell Law School, uh, summa cum laude. Uh, Jerry, it's just such a delight to be uh, with you today as always. Well, I'm pleased to be with you, Ravi, and thanks, Nick, and the Fed Talk for putting this together. I, I want to quibble with just one thing you said, Ravi. As I advance in years, I prefer not to be called an old friend of <laughs> you or anyone else. I, I prefer to hear me described as a longtime buddy. <laughs> and, and to that charge, I'll plead guilty. Uh, Robert George has been um, an inspiration to me. Uh, for decades, and I value his friendship and professional collaboration. It's one of the great privileges of my professional life and personal life. Well, Jerry, the topic uh, we have on the table today uh, fundamentally involves human rights. Uh, it's the question of the rights of the unborn uh, human being. So the first uh, thing we ought to talk about, it seems to me, is what does it mean to have a human right? What, what are human rights? I, I don't mean which particular ones that people have, but what are we talking about when we're talking about human rights? We live at a time uh, when human rights discourse is the dominant discourse in much discussion of ethics and politics. Much of our discussion of, of justice uh, is in the language of human rights. But when we speak of human rights, if we're to put some rigor in the concept, what does it mean? What are we talking about? Well, I think that the most important component or aspect of the concept um, is the, the unconditional nature of these rights. And what I mean by that, uh, Robbie, is that we're talking about um, rights, uh, protections, uh, how people are beneficiaries of the moral and legal duties of other people. And I think what distinguishes human rights, uh, more strictly speaking, is that they belong to and can be predicated of human beings just by virtue of what they are, of their status as human beings. These are rights that do not depend for their enjoyment, you might say, by the possession of a particular ability or set of skills or any other contingent feature of human persons, but rather what can be predicated of, of human persons uh, just as such. And in that respect, built into or baked into the concept of human rights, I think are two things of uh, special importance. One is that they're universal, that they are to be enjoyed and uh, ascribed to any, anyone who is a human being. And the other is that they are um, not only universal in their scope, uh, but unconditional in their nature. And I mean by that, not to say that every human right is absolute. I, I don't mean to say that at all, but unconditional meaning that they make claims, human rights make claims on us. They're not matters 
of convenience to everyone else but that they arise and call for recognition by human persons, the rest of us, as to what is owed to other human beings. And in that respect, are not at all like applying for membership in a club. They're not negotiable. Uh, they really have um, this kind of fundamental moral traction on us. So that once an individual is recognized as being owed these duties, then there's not much more to say than that the duties must be respected and performed by the rest of us. Of course, human rights discourse is universal in the sense that uh, everybody across the globe these days seems to want to conduct discussions of ethics and politics, discussions of justice in the language of human rights. But for those of us uh, in the United States, any talk of human rights immediately brings up the founding principles of our country. Probably the first thing to come to the mind of most of our viewers today uh, are those words from the Declaration of Independence, the second sentence of the Declaration. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, and among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Uh, often when we discuss those uh, words, that principle, when we discuss the declaration and its claims, uh, we contrast the respect in which people are equal, that fundamental way in which people are equal, from the many ways in which people are self-evidently, one might say, unequal. <laughs> Human beings are unequal in intelligence. Clearly, that's true. Uh, they are unequal in athletic prowess, in strength, in beauty, uh, in charm. Obviously, people are unequal in wealth, uh, in uh, social status. Uh, there are so many ways in which people are unequal it causes one to wonder in what respect could we say that all human beings are equal? And here, the concept of human dignity is often invoked. And I want to ask you about that, Jerry, because the typical answer, including my answer, it's the one I typically give to the question, well, okay, if we have all these inequalities in human experience, in what respect are we equal? What I want to say, and what many people want to say, is, well, we're equal in fundamental worth and dignity. Now, of course, there are critics of that claim. Famously, Steve Pinker at Harvard is a critic of that claim. Uh, he is among those who say the concept of dignity is simply doing no work there. Uh, it's a phony uh, concept. Uh, it masks something else that must really be going uh, on there. Uh, famously, in his uh, debates with Leon Cass, Professor Pinker has, uh, has made this uh, point. And I take that as a serious challenge because Pinker is a serious man. Uh, so I'm going to flip it over to you, Jerry, and say, is the concept of dignity actually doing any work there? Can we put any rigor into it? What does it mean is it the right answer to the question, in what respect then, in view of all the inequalities of human beings, are we fundamentally equal? Well, I think it is part of the answer to that question. And I do think the term dignity does work in moral analysis and for that matter in legal analysis. I can think of at least three meanings, relevant meanings of dignity. And I think these are not, a, not in the slightest bit exclusive one of the other, but mutually reinforcing. I mean, for Christians in particular, but in, in to varying degrees, other believers, one important meaning of dignity is theological, meaning that we are made in the image of God and that there's a certain dignity and value and status and worth that humans enjoy by virtue of being those beings for, made in God's own image and brought into being to serve God in this world and to be happy with God in the next. So that's, there's that meaning. Now in, in more, you might call it secular legal discourse, I think a second meaning of dignity is that which is true 
of those beings who possess this dignity and by virtue of which they are owed uh, certain legal and moral duties. So here we'll leave aside theology and say that dignity refers to that about us, that which makes it the case that we are beneficiaries of rights and beneficiaries of moral duties. So that, that I think is a matter of being human beings. And I think the defining feature in this regard is that human beings are individual substances of a rational nature. And I, the key concept there is the radical capacity for rational existence, free choice, conceptual thought, et cetera. But a third meaning, which I think, again, is, is, is works uh, productively with the other two in mind, to say human dignity really is a, another way of expressing in a very shorthand and compressed way, the requirements of practical reasoning uh, and to express or a shorthanded way to summarize or to at least name or label those most fundamental duties and justice that we owe to other people. So to put that differently, there are certain human rights that are that are unconditional and you might say absolute. That is to say, it is never right and should never be lawful to torture a person, to enslave a person, to intentionally kill a person. We might well, I think, usefully describe those aspects, uh, you might say irreducible aspects of human well-being, which are protected by these exceptionless duties as aspects of basic human dignity. So that again, it, here, it's just another way of expressing the requirements of practical reason. But one could say uh, the, to treat someone in violation of their human dignity is another way of saying that a person is being treated in a way that is fundamentally unjust. That's helpful, Jerry. Uh, and I wonder about the relationship between the first and uh, second uh, categories uh, in your discourse of a moment ago. Uh, and I'm specifically wondering whether they might not just be two sides of uh, mm -hmm. the same coin. So let me uh, dig into that uh, a little bit. Let's get at it by raising the question of the difference between human beings and other things, uh, animals, non-human animals, um, plants, uh, inanimate uh, objects. Uh, if there's something special about human beings that we're trying to capture with the word dignity, what is the special thing? What makes us different from, let's say, fairly intelligent non-human animals, porpoises, dolphins, uh, various ape uh, species, uh, pigs? What's the thing about us? Now, let's go to your first uh, category there, which uh, our Jewish friends, I think, would be very quick and right to point out is, is not anything invented by the Christians. This is the Jewish revelation. This goes all the way back uh, to the beginning of the Bible. It's in the very first chapter of Genesis that the human being is made from dust of the earth, to be sure, just manufactured out of uh, the most uh, elemental materials, but is fashioned in the very image and likeness of the divine creator and ruler of all that is, the very image and likeness of God, the concept of the imago Dei. What does that mean for man to be made in the image and likeness of God? Well, it can't mean that God has five fingers on each of two hands and hair on his head and a nose. Mm -hmm. Since God is conceived by religious folk in the monotheistic tradition, uh, is spiritual, not material. So it can't be that. In what respect then are human beings godlike? Now the answer given classically, I think by Jewish as well as Christian thinkers, is that human beings are godlike in that they possess agency, rationality, and freedom, which are mutually uh, 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 re re they require each other. I can only be truly free if I'm rational. I can only be rational if I'm in some important respect free. Now by free here, I don't, I'm not referring as you know, to political freedom, but what's sometimes called metaphysical freedom, free choice, freedom of the, of, of the will. Now that freedom will be constrained in lots of ways. And obviously we are not uh, God 
we may be godlike, but if we're godlike, we're godlike in very limited ways. Uh, God, if there is a God, uh, is um, infinite. We are finite. He's perfect. We are very, very, very much uh, imperfect. And yet, this Jewish claim, adopted by Christianity as well, is that we are in some respects limited ways, but nevertheless really godlike. And that must be because, like God, as conceived by Christians and Jews, we are able to deliberate, judge, choose. We have agency. We can envisage states of affairs that do not exist, grasp the intelligible point, the value, the purpose, the good of bringing them into existence, and then act freely on our rational grasp of the intelligible point of doing so to bring such a state of affairs into existence, to choose freely, not to act on the basis of impulse or instinct, like a brute animal, even the highest level of intelligence brute animals, but freely, rationally, in that respect, uh, godlike. Now, that account that I've just given, if it's valid, would not necessarily actually require the affirmation that there is a God. In that sense, a secular person can, and you and I both know secular people who do, affirm the dignity of human beings, human rights, on the basis of human agency, the awesome powers of reason and freedom, that they affirm without offering any particular account of any particular theological account of how those realities, those human realities of reason and freedom come into being or why we have them or how we have them or who gave them to us or whether there is any more than merely human source uh, uh, of them. Now, those latter questions are very interesting the theological questions and, and theists and secularists would disagree about whether we need to answer that question and if we do what the answer to the question is. But the secular account of human dignity that might be given by an advocate of, 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 of human rights would really pretty much track that second of your um, points in what you said earlier. And in doing so would be the secular counterpart to what from the religious person's point of view is your first point, that man is made in the image and likeness of God and that's the foundation of his, of his dignity. What's No, I you? quite agree. I mean, it, it, I think you're quite right. And, you know, believers um, uh, of, of various stripes have different expressions and different conceptual resources from within their traditions to describe what to Christians and to certainly a large extent uh, Jews would recognize as um, the sense of saying as they do that mankind, humankind, uh, we're the creatures that God made for his own sake. And on at least a further refinement of that in the New Testament would be the the sense that uh, human beings can be adopted by God and become kind of made fit for fellowship with God in heaven. But as to the the more the more secular side of it, or the second of my my three uh, aspects of dignity, I think you're quite right. And, and we we do see many people who affirm without reservation the existence of, of basic human rights and, and can describe them very much along the lines that you or I, who happen to be believers, would describe them without the theological apparatus. So I, I think you're quite right. What One point I would add that I find um, interesting and, and I think underappreciated uh, in philosophical discourse about human rights and their source sources, uh, I just referenced Thomas Nagel's book on Darwinian theory, yes. Darwinian evolution, where- His book on consciousness, yeah. Yeah, I mean, and, and what I, I'll just refer to it. It's, it's not our main interest. But Nagel, who I, I think is really quite a secular-minded person, uh, is caused to consider in, in, in a rigorous and honest way uh, the source of the spiritual properties, the, the rational nature of human persons. By that, he means the capacity for conceptual thought, for understanding uh, value, moral value, free choice, consciousness, and even what you might call noose or even a soul. 
but Nagel makes the comes to the conclusion, I guess, with some reluctance, because as I say, I, I don't think he's a believer. But he says these uh, immaterial realities can't be denied. That is, they do exist, and they cannot arise according to the Darwinian description of evolution. That is to say, they can't arise from any evolution of uh, non-spiritual matter. So Precisely that, because they're immaterial. That's exactly right. right. Yeah, so the Darwinian mechanism can only work on material. Correct. So that's Nagel's point. And in fact, I think we can go a little farther. I, uh, I've read Nagel closely on this, and he says not only does he not believe in God, that he doesn't want it to be true that there is a God. Right. So he's not only an atheist, he's in a certain sense an anti-theist. And yet, he argues, we have the evidence under our noses uh, right before our faces, we have the evidence of human powers that are not reducible to material and efficient causality. So he doesn't want to move from that to the idea that there's a God, but that means there's something very special about human beings. Now, the way I've heard some who are in Nagel, Nagel's camp uh, move on this is to say, it's not that man is made in the image and likeness of God. It is that man makes God in his image and likeness. Right. We perceive on the basis of our ordinary elementary experience that we have these extraordinary immaterial powers, deliberation, judgment, choice, conceptual thought, so forth. And then we, in trying to account for them, um, imagine that there is a God who perfectly uh, embodies them, almost like a transcendent uh, platonic uh, form, and that we're a kind of image of, of that. But look at what's being agreed on here. What's being agreed on is that human beings are extraordinary. They have literally awesome powers that cannot be uh, accounted for by purely material causality. And therefore, human beings as the possessors of these literally awesome powers have a certain dignity, an inviolability, have certain rights just in virtue of their humanity, which was your definition of what a human right is. It's a right you have not because you earned it, not because of some ability you developed, not because of some test you passed, not because of your strength or beauty or intelligence or athletic prowess or whatever, just in virtue of mm -hmm. being human. Right, right. It's interesting, as you say, I think it's quite quite apt to say Nagel doesn't want to believe in God. Yeah, when at the end of the day, at the end of his book, there's really just two possibilities which he which he conjures, and I think they are the only two possibilities. Either there is some much greater than human intelligence and source of these immaterial realities, or in the I hesitate to use a Rawlsian expression in this context, but in the original position, that is, at the beginning of the universe, it wasn't just rock and gas. The only alternative, as I remember, Nagel's argument to there being some kind of being that we might call God would be that in the beginning, the original matter had these spiritual properties somehow built into that original matter, which would be some kind of, if I understand my terminology correctly, some kind of panentheist beginning to the universe. The evidence for which I think is scant, uh, and there's where that's where Nagel leaves it. Yeah, interesting. I, I would just uh, say to listeners, in case uh, people were wondering, Professor Bradley used the distinctive term panentheist. He wasn't saying pantheist. That's a slightly different uh, mm -hmm. uh, view. Uh, he was referring to panentheism, which along with theism and polytheism and pantheism is another competitor uh, in, the, uh, in the metaphysical uh, competition, in the metaphysical uh, contest. But I'll leave um, people to their search engines to, to look yeah. up an entheism and its differences from uh, uh, pantheism. But this, Jerry, now takes us uh, to the topic of the wonderful book that was uh, edited, the collection of essays to which you contributed that was edited by Pilar uh, Zambrano and her co-editor, uh, our friend, uh, William uh, Saunders, Unborn Human Life and Fundamental Rights. Uh, I wonder if uh, listeners noted in your very first uh, contribution to this uh, discussion, your reference to uh, human beings as bearers of dignity, human rights, as human beings, as 
substances of a rational nature. That is what gives us our distinctive dignity, our inviolability, makes us special, the awesome thing, is not the immediately exercisable capacities for deliberation, judgment, choice, conceptual thought, moral evaluation, and so forth. Since we have the dignity of our humanity when we're asleep or when we're under general anesthesia or when we're in a coma, it can't be the immediately exercisable capacities, although this view is contested, of course, by some uh, philosophers, famously Peter Singer, uh, my colleague here at, uh, at, at Princeton, Jeffrey McMahon, the very distinguished Whites professor of moral philosophy at Oxford. But it seems to me it can't be the immediately exercisable capacity. It must therefore be something that you mentioned very quickly in passing, Jerry, and I want to focus on it now. The radical capacities, radical here equals root, the root capacities for deliberation, judgment, and choice. The capacities that we have from the point at which we come into being as human beings and which we retain when we're asleep, we're in uh, comas, when we're under general uh, anesthesia, uh, when we're suffering from dementia, such as Alzheimer's diseases, uh, disease and, and so forth, that we retain up until the point where we no longer exist. That is, we retain till death. Um, now, that is the core of the ethical argument for the inviolability, not only of healthy, uh, alert, awake uh, 19-year-olds, but also of those who are cognitively impaired, those suffering from dementias, those who are newborn infants, who under Professor Singer's theory would not uh, be bearers of dignity, would not be persons, but also the un- born and even the, the newly conceived, if we have our rights in virtue of our humanity, then the only question we need the answer to is, who is a human being? Do we have a human being here? The alternative is to distinguish human beings from persons, which is precisely what Professor Singer and Professor uh, McMahon do, as, as well as some others. They say, well, look, of course, unborn children, newborn children, people suffering from dementias, people uh, congenitally, cognitively, severely disabled, of course, they are human beings. What else are they? Uh, so they don't try to justify abortion or euthanasia or these other things on the basis that there's no human being there or that they don't know when human life begins. Uh, Singer has castigated those who claim that abortion is not the taking of a human life, quite rightly, and I commend his honesty. Um, he doesn't want to fly under a false flag or claim something that's self-evidently false. We know that newborn human beings, cognitively disabled people, people in Alzheimer's, with Alzheimer's disease, unborn children are human beings. But the Singer-McMahon move is to distinguish human beings from persons and say that while um, most persons, most human beings are persons, that is human beings who are born and have some minimal level of cognitive uh, functioning. Um, some human beings are not persons. Either they're not yet persons, though they may become, uh, or they're no longer persons, though they once were, or in the case of severely cognitively disabled human beings, they never were persons, aren't now persons, and never will be uh, uh, persons. And that, it seems to me, that is the real debate over the status of unborn human life. It is not a debate about whether you have a human being um, uh, in the case of um, uh, an elderly person who, for whom euthanasia is being contemplated or a severely cognitively disabled person or a newborn that somebody wants to get rid of or an unborn child, we know we've got a human being. It's a question of whether there's a distinction between human beings and persons such that being a human being is not enough. The human rights claim, and this is why Professor Singer does not endorse the concept of human rights or do business in that language, the human rights claim is that you have rights, fundamental rights, inviolability, dignity, personhood, you might say, in virtue of your humanity. All we need to know is the answer to, is, is the answer to the question, is this or is this not a human being? Right. Well, I think as you've described it, you've, you've teed up the, um, the argument uh, against 
the position of Jeff McMahon and Peter Singer. Um, and I think the basic strategy for anyone like ourselves, any of our viewers and listeners who would make the argument for the inviolability of human life from conception on, I think we can see that the, the structure of the argument uh, really has to be that um, to make the criterion of uh, personhood turn upon something other than radical capacity upon, for example, the possession of some abilities or a presently exercisable ability or some other kinds of achievement is to fly in the face of the intuition, which thankfully most people, in fact, maybe almost all people still have, which is at least that once you're born, you count. And that, you know, whether you're debilitated or poor, tall, or even in a coma, uh, once you are born, then you count the same. So one, uh, one asset in the argument for the inviolability of unborn human life is I think the still very, very widespread notion uh, the um, the sort of universal equality with respect to the right to life of everybody who is born, no matter what their condition is. And Jeff McMahon and Peter Singer have trouble. Now, they, of course, are honest enough to admit that, well, yes, I'm willing to accept that effect or that implication of my argument. But their argument succeeds in leaving exposed to violence the unborn, but at the price of exposing, you might say, to violence, quite a few people who are already born and are you know, amongst us, even some people who are walking around. Now to make the argument, to take on their argument, which I think is the strongest argument against the position that people from conception on an inviolable right to life, I think we have to take on the proposition that as, as they, I think, would agree, there are some, and in fact, many unique living human individuals who actually are not persons, or if they don't want to use the word person, are not rights-bearing human individuals. Now that introduces, I think that it, that means that some of us are not, we're not our bodies. That is to say, we, you, I, Nick Marr, did not begin when our bodies began, which surely did happen at conception, but you, I, Nick Marr, Harry Blackman, you name it, uh, came to be sometime after conception. And I think that the second part of the argument against that position is to try to challenge your interlocutor to name a non-arbitrary point where we came to be. That is to say, if we didn't come to be when our bodies came to be, and our bodies came to be at conception with, their, with the radical capacity for rational life, then when That's what did, rational nature means, a substance of nature. rational so when, nature. When did and we come to be? Those radical capacities for deliberation, judgment, choice, conceptual right. thinking. And I, and I don't think that there's a, a coherent or at least satisfying answer. That is to say, when did we come to be, if not a conception? I think birth and viability are particularly inauspicious candidates for that. Um, to think that birth... And, and, Singer, and Singer agrees with you about that, Jerry. Yeah, uh, Singer, Singer and McMahon are the first to say birth is arbitrary, and, yeah. and that's why both say, "Look, you know, if, if you if you accept abortion as they do, a uh, general right to abortion, elective abortion, if you if you accept it as they do, then you know you're committed to accepting the moral permissibility of infanticide, not just for severely uh, uh, right. damaged uh, newborn babies, but for any baby that a parent doesn't want. You obviously are also committed to the idea that uh, there's." Nothing in principle uh, wrong with uh, killing cognitively disabled people. Now, those are those on the Singer McMahon account are human beings who are never persons. So they there's a body, but not a person. They they can be 19 years old, as you say. They could even be walking around, yeah. although se severely cognitively disabled, and they are not persons. There, there's a the body without a person there, and of course. Uh, uh, I and Patrick Lee and you and John Finnis and uh, uh, others um, uh, who are writing uh, today have offered our own philosophical criticism of this concept of the separation of self and body. Pat Patrick Lee and I have done that in our in our book, Body Self Dualism in Contemporary Ethics, Ethics and Politics. We just don't think that a that a credible, a tenable philosophical argument can be made to justify that dualism of person and body or self and body, the idea that the body is 
that the self is something uh, other than the body that merely inhabits the body, that we are ghosts and machines, persons inhabiting bodies, if there happens to be a person inhabiting that, that body. Yeah. Jerry, I want to uh, now move to your particular essay, the contribution you uh, made to the book, which will take us into an interestingly different subject. I, I should say to our viewers that, uh, that the book can, in, includes contributions from scholars from a number of different uh, countries, uh, Canada, uh, Spain, uh, Ireland, uh, uh, some of the uh, Latin American uh, countries, uh, talking about the legal status of unborn human beings, unborn human life in those countries. And a lot of the essays explore uh, the question of the regulation of attacks on unborn human life uh, in as much in, in, insofar as it is a question handled by, in this or that particular country, the legislature or the courts. So there are some important and valuable essays there. We're not going to have time to talk a lot about them, but I do want to turn to Professor Bradley's uh, own essay, which is about the United States. He's the American representative uh, in the book. And of course, right now we're talking about the subject when the Supreme Court is on the verge of uh, reconsidering. In fact, it's in the, in, the, in the midst of reconsidering. It's already heard oral argument, reconsidering its 1973 decision uh, in Roe versus Wade, uh, invalidating uh, abortion uh, regulations, the protection of human life uh, before birth uh, in, the, in the states, uh, with a view to possibly significantly uh, altering that decision, or as I have been predicting, uh, completely overturning it and returning the question of regulation uh, to legislatures. Uh, it has been handled since 1973 essentially by courts uh, in the United States. There have been some room for legislative movement here at the margins with various uh, efforts that can be made to uh, uh, limit abortion or protect unborn life just at the margins. But uh, if the court does what I'm predicting it will do, it will mean that the matter returns now to the states. It won't mean, it's very important for participants to understand this, if the court acts as I predict it will act, it will not mean that abortion goes from being lawful in the United States to being unlawful. It simply means the question now will be in the hands of the legislature. First, the state legislatures, and then the question, will Congress, pursuant to its authority under Section 5 of the 14th Amendment to uh, uh, enforce the guarantees of Section 1 of the 14th Amendment, the due process and equal protection of the law's guarantees, will Congress uh, move in? But Jerry, why don't you talk a bit about that uh, contribution that, uh, that, that you made, and especially your uh, treatment of the question of third-party homicides against unborn children and the prosecution of people not for abortions, but for causing uh, the death of an unborn child in the case of an assault on the mother. Well, surely, Robbie. And as a matter of fact, uh, at least according to the news reports I saw this morning, apropos a point you were just making, I think the Senate is scheduled to vote tonight on the Women's Health Protection Act, which uh, will not pass the Senate, I'm assured, but would make it as a matter of national statutory law, would, would they say codify Roe, uh, which is not exactly correct, since in some ways it goes even beyond uh, Roe versus Wade and the judge-made law of abortion. Uh, but the Senate is considering this evening, if, unless something has changed in the last couple of hours, uh, statutory protections of a right or a right of access to abortion, which would be good in all 50 states. And that uh, attempt at lawmaking is predicated both on Section 5 and on the Commerce Clause, as a matter of fact. So that's been teed up and um, is really, a, a, it won't pass this time, but um, is worth watching. Now, as we go to the, the I, my chapter contribution to the Saunders-Zambrano volume focused on the anomaly, uh, the puzzle even, of feticide laws, the generic term, not, a, not, they're not meant in any technical sense, or you could say laws that focus upon the uh, killing or uh, the homicides concerning unborn victims. Uh, 38 states have some sort of feticide law, as well as there, there's a feticide law in the uh, federal jurisdiction, the Unborn Victims of Violence Act, 
passed during the, the Bush administration. And my interest in this argument, and I'll describe my argument briefly in just one minute, uh, arose in connection with the Federal Unborn Victims of Violence Act. I had the, uh, the privilege of testifying in Congress two or three times on that act. And in short, uh, it says the, the, the act styles itself that it could be called Lacey and Connors law. And it's a federal law, uh, in, a, in essence, making a criminal homicide of the same proportion and severity of the killing of an unborn child um, compared to the mother. So to put it differently, in a case like uh, Scott Peterson, who killed uh, both his wife and his unborn child, Lacey and Connor, uh, he's in California prison for two murders. And that's pretty much what the federal law does. So what triggered some interest in an argument I make in a, in a, in a, in a, with some care in this volume was my testimony in Congress. And I described it as an anomaly. And I put it this way, that under federal law, the law that we were then testifying about, in which Congress passed, and which is the law now, here's the situation. The human person is protected from the moment of conception against being intentionally killed or another, any other way criminally killed or harmed. And the unborn child enjoys exactly the same protection against violent acts that everyone else enjoys. You, me, Congressman Nadler, Senator Schumer, you name it, the same, except for the lethal actions of that child's mother. And I said that if this strikes anyone in the room as anomalous, the anomaly lies with Roe versus Wade and not with our thinking about homicide. So the feticide laws uh, protect the unborn just as they would protect anybody else, except with regard to abortion. Now, the abortion reservation has been mandated, really, by the Supreme Court in Roe versus Wade. If Roe versus Wade goes off the books in June, late June of this year, as you predict and as I think it will, then that reservation is no longer compelled by constitutional law. So the question will then be, what will protect, what will prevent state legislatures at that point after Roe is overturned? Um, how will state legislatures in California, for example, let me put it this way, how will California continue after Roe to make it murder for Scott Peterson to kill his unborn son? At the same time, in California, it would be entirely within the rights of the mother to kill the same child. Now that inequality of protection, once Roe is removed as an artificial or arbitrary stipulation in favor of the mother, that anomaly, aberration, will become open and glaring. And I would suggest that there's an equal protection argument in any place like California which protects the unborn against everybody but that person's mother. How is it that when the unborn child is killed by its father, Scott Peterson, uh, the, it's never justified in law, but if the mother should kill the same child, the norms of justification don't even apply. And I think after Roe is removed as a prop for that artificial distinction, uh, and then I think there's a real equal protection argument. Jerry, uh, the one argument that I can think of with any remote plausibility to make that anomaly go away is to treat abortion not as the right to kill the unborn child, but rather as the mother's right to evict the child mm -hmm. from her womb as an uninvited uh, trespasser. Now that would require that you embrace a really radically individualistic idea of human relationships and responsibilities, uh, a, a, a sort of individualism that uh, is ordinarily treated by folks on the left as anathema, uh, you know, one that that dissolves human bonds, dissolves responsibility of people for each other, and so forth. But yet. Uh, perhaps in a last ditch effort to save the right to abortion, they might embrace that argument. It was famously made in 1971 by the MIT philosopher Judith Thompson, Judith uh, Jarvis Thompson, and 
her um, version of the argument was uh, colorful and interesting. She said, imagine that you wake up one morning and you find yourself attached uh, by a cord, kidney to kidney with a famous violinist. Turns out he's had kidney failure. You've been uh, kidnapped. Uh, you've been um, uh, put in bed next to the violinist. The cord uh, is to, from your, your kidney to his uh, kidney, keeps him uh, alive. Now Thompson says, it can't be the case that you are morally required and it certainly shouldn't be legally required to stay attached to the violinist for nine months. Let's say the violinist could recover in nine months, but it's gonna take nine months. You couldn't be required uh, to stay attached. Now, if you choose to stay attached in order to preserve the violinist's life, then you're a good Samaritan, indeed a very good Samaritan. You're not required to be a good uh, Samaritan. That's an act of supererogation if you, if, if you perform it. You have every moral right and you should, of course, have every legal right to, uh, to detach. Now she says, now look, I'm not saying you have a right to order the death of the child. Mm -hmm. So if the child survives, you don't have any right to kill it. The right to abortion is not a right to a dead fetus. The right to abortion is a right to evict the fetus, the child developing in the womb from the womb. Thompson herself says, we have to admit that from a fairly early point, you've got not only a human being, but a person. So she doesn't want to go down the singer uh, McMahon uh, uh, path. Uh, it, it, and that was available in those days from uh, the philosopher Michael Tooley, who was making the kind of argument that that uh, uh, Singer and McMahon uh, make. So this was familiar to Thompson. Uh, in fact, Tooley had an arg article that appeared in the same issue of Philosophy and Public Affairs, the journal that uh, Thompson's article appeared in, as I recall. Um, but what about that, that argument, Jerry? Well, it is, you're quite right. I mean, Thompson, um, really, I guess, to her everlasting credit, uh, wants to argue the matter out and does attempt to argue the matter out um, in 1971 as an investigation into the, uh, the precise contours of justified killing. That is to say, and as you're suggesting, she's not offering up an argument, you might say, for abortion license by virtue of the, the fact uh, or judgment that the unborn simply don't count. In fact, for argument's sake, she takes on board the view of her pro-life interlocutors that you have an individual, human individuals entitled to the protections uh, of law, but um, her argument is that it's, it's um, an exaggeration, an unwarranted exaggeration of the scope of unjustified killing to say a woman can't have an abortion. Now about that, I would say a few things. Uh, one, I think that, that in truth, that is really where the argument goes and where it stays once we establish, if, if we can establish that the unborn have rights. That is to say, um, what we're talking about with Dobbs and reform of the law in the wake of Dobbs, if Dobbs should overrule Roe. Dobbs I mean, being the case currently under review at the Yeah, form, yeah Dobbs is the case under course. review. I mean, I think you might say the, the, the beachhead that um, pro-life persons have tried to establish over the years is to uh, do exactly what Thompson takes for granted, which is to examine uh, abortion through the lens or according to the criteria of justified killing of a human being. She takes a view, as you described, that it can be a, a form of justified killing for the woman, just as it would be to evict the violinist. I'll leave aside um, qualifications that might be offered in a fuller response to your question, Robbie, about whether the analogy is, is just right. Um, not in, in, in many cases, most cases, um, it's not correct to analogize uh, pregnancy to this uninvited sudden eruption of a violinist who dis you discover in your bed the next morning. Um, but I do think that I would say this, that um, Thompson's argument, I think, gains its uh, rhetorical force by taking a view of the matter that I would describe as, as one of sort of sovereign prerogative. Uh, that is to say, it's my body and I can decide what happens to it. And nobody, uh, nobody really can decide that I have to share my body. I don't think, though that, that has a certain rhetorical appeal or plausibility, I actually don't think that's correct as a moral matter. I don't think it matters how anyone 
all of us, any one of us, finds ourselves in a relationship of dependence with a helpless individual, uh, whether that person climbs into a lifeboat that we're already inhabiting, or whether someone drops a baby on the front door of our house, whether there's an unexpected pregnancy. I don't think that the key question about the fairness of using lethal force against another person depends upon how that person crossed our path. And that even if it were the case, or to the extent it's the case, that we find ourselves suddenly uh, um, saddled with an unwelcome dependent person, I do not think it's morally sound to say, well, by virtue of that person being an intruder, I have no particular moral obligation. And in fact, the law should treat me or give me the authority to eliminate that intruder. It would be a little bit like going back to, in, in, in American and English law, you know, to spring gun cases that we studied in torts, where the idea there was, look, um, it's my yard and it's my garden. And while I'm not here, I don't want anybody poaching. So I'm going to set up a spring, bun, a spring gun. And if it kills some kid who wanders in to pick a daisy, then so be it, because they don't belong there. I actually think that's morally unsound. And I do think that thinking of even, even the violinist as, as someone who deserves to be separated or cut off, I think is morally unsound. The question about what our obligations are to pe people who are dependent upon us, in fact, for their well-being and even for their existence is a question of justice. And what is required by justice when those relations arise is at times a difficult question to settle. Uh, but I think it's a matter of applying the golden rule. Would one, if one could imagine oneself being the dependent partner in a two-person relationship, whether it's the violinist or a person who has struggled to climb into your lifeboat or an unborn child, if you were that individual, would you think it's fair and fitting that you simply be thrown overboard or cut off? And that's what I mean by saying applying the golden rule. So the requirements of justice are not disposed of in quite the way that I think Thompson describes. Well, of course, there's a vast body of, uh, of, of literature, um, defenses of Thompson by distinguished philosophers like Francis Cam, criti criticisms of Thompson by uh, Jerry Bradley, for one, but also Frank Beckwith, uh, Patrick Lee, uh, many others. Uh, one point, though, that I'd uh, raise, Jerry, is my own recollection from law school uh, is that we were taught that there are areas in which parents have particular and special responsibilities to their own children, responsibilities they don't have, for example, to other people's children. You, you, you can't with impunity go, you know, kill other people's children or harm other people's children, certainly not. But there are some things that you don't have to affirmatively do for other people's children that you do for your own. For example, if I recall correctly, and you can check me on this, um, in the United States, unlike uh, European jurisdictions, we don't have so-called Good Samaritan laws. Right. If a child is drowning uh, in a pool of water and you're walking by as an adult, um, you know, a, a morally virtuous person, especially if there's no significant risk to himself or herself, you know, would, would get in there and rescue that child. But my understanding of U.S. law, or most U.S. law, is that uh, most states, you can't be prosecuted for failing to do that good thing. You're a very bad person if you fail to do it, but you can't be prosecuted unless it's your child. If it's your child, the special responsibilities that you have to your own uh, children uh, prevail. Am I, am I remembering that correctly? It's been a long time since uh, since law school. No, I think you're remembering correctly, yes. Yeah. You know, so that the the, um, the unique, I mean, I, I should stress or, or add that um, I agree with Thompson that the question presented by abortion, the question of abortion, is a, is a matter of justified killing. And I do think also that uh, the pregnant woman is in a unique position vis-a-vis uh, -vis this unborn child, and that the question of her justified use of lethal force, or that is to say her justified resort to an operation to terminate a pregnancy, foreseeing certainly that the baby would die. Uh, that's a question of justified justification, which has no correspondence with any other person. 
so that applying the norms of justified killing to the case of pregnancy raises unique sub-questions and nuances, and that a woman's moral deliberation or the range of choices available to her as a moral and in turn legal matter, I think are broader than for anyone else. I think under any any sound view of the question, Scott Peterson would never, ever have lawful justification to kill his unborn son. And at least there's a discussion to be had about the scope of a woman's uh, lawful justification vis-a-vis the child within her, only because the child is in a position as, as being you know, resident within her body to present some threat of harm to that yes. woman during and, pregnancy. And here, of that course, makes her... Yeah, yeah, historically American uh, law, uh, the, the law struck down by Roe versus Wade, uh, always permitted acts that resulted in the death of the unborn child if they were necessary in order to preserve uh, maternal life. Uh, that was that was built in. Uh, yeah. e- even uh, uh, moral and religious traditions that um, uh, had firm uh, protections for unborn human life uh, allowed, for example, uh, that uh, if a woman is uh, carrying a child and she develops a uh, uterine cancer that is uh, uh, threatening her life and it's before the child can be uh, delivered before fetal uh, viability, where removing uh, the womb will result unavoidably in the death of the, of the child. Uh, the Catholic tradition, uh, other traditions uh, held that that was nevertheless uh, permissible. There, the object of the choice is not getting the child dead. The object of the choice is to preserve maternal life with the death of the child being a foreseen and regrettable uh, but acceptable uh, side effect. There are, of course, other questions to be gone into uh, here. I wish we had more time. And those are the questions of obligations that we have to women, especially women who are in difficult situations with uh, pregnancy. There's a very important question of the obligations of fathers to their children, not just not just mothers that have obligations. Fathers can, in my view, rightly be held responsible financially uh, for uh, uh, their their children, can't be let off the hook on the ground that, well, the woman could have uh, gotten an abortion. Although if you permit abortion, it obviously is going to raise this issue of resentment if a father has no choice about whether the baby's born or not, and then is required to provide financial support. Many fathers would say, well, it shouldn't be up to me she had the choice about whether to have the child. She had the child, so her financial responsibility. But there are important questions, not just about women, but about men's responsibilities to women and to the children that uh, that they sire. And I wish we had more time to go into those. Uh, Brother Nick Marr, uh, we've invited questions from uh, the audience. Are there any questions in, in chat? I'm not seeing them up here, but maybe they're coming in, Nick, to you without my seeing them. I don't see any yet, but uh, everyone, if everyone has a couple more minutes, maybe we can take one or two audience. Well, questions. we have a couple. Of, we have a couple more minutes. If anybody does want to uh, want to submit them, um, uh, I, Jerry, I, I, I should point out. Uh, I'll go ahead, Jerry. Yeah, you know, while we're waiting for questions, and I hope there are some, um, to say a further word about the Saunders Zambrano volume, um, as you described it. It's a collection of essays from leading uh, law professors, um, some legal philosophers, but I should stress for our our, our viewers that it's a book written by lawyers for lawyers. One of its many strains, this is the the Zambrano Saunders volume, is not only its breadth, it is covering Europe, Eastern Europe, Western Europe, and Central and South America, as it does, uh, and also uh, Canada and the United States, but it's really, uh, you know, quite useful insofar as it describes, the authors describe in, in detail the different paths that the national jurisdictions have taken to their present state of play vis-a-vis abortion. And the differences among those national paths are quite, quite interesting and enlightening, as are some of the similarities across legal cultures. Uh, but it's, uh, it's a book written for persons interested in the, the, the intricacies, or at least the the uh, legal analytical moves that have uh, produced uh, abortion law in these various jurisdictions, which in these various jurisdictions, the abortion laws that are under investigation are uh, by and large quite permissive. So it has that great value. And it also has a concluding reflection, at least a short chapter, 
by Robbie's former professor and my former colleague, um, John Finnis. Magisterial uh, piece, magisterial. Which itself is just, a, yeah, it's, yeah. It's, worth, it's worth a read. Yeah, it's worth the price of the book. Uh, Jerry, we do have some questions that have come in. We only have a very short period of time uh, to, to answer them. Let's uh, get right to them. Uh, there's one here that's for me, uh, Professor George, but I, I'd like your answer as well. Uh, Professor George, do you think Dobbs, that's the case currently before yeah. the court uh, reconsidering Roe versus Wade, will be six to three or five to four? I've already said that I'm predicting that the Supreme Court will overturn Roe versus Wade. Uh, and I'm going way out on a limb to say that I believe it will actually be 6-3. A lot of people are skeptical of that. Even some people who think that it will be overturned, Roe will be overturned, are skeptical of my claim that it will be 6-3. And I could turn out to be completely wrong here, of course. But uh, here's my reasoning. Um, uh, I, Justice Roberts clearly understands that Roe against Wade was incorrectly decided. He's made that clear many, many times. The question of whether to uphold it uh, for him is a question of whether the precedent the precedential uh, value, stare decisis, what lawyers call stare decisis, requires that the case, which has been on the books for years and years and years, uh, be be upheld. Uh, I think when he's considering that, one of the things he's going to be thinking about, especially if there are already five justices to overturn Roe, is who he wants to write the decision. If he does not join the majority, that will mean that he will lose the right to assign the case, assign the majority opinion. Uh, to himself or to, to some other justice in the majority. Uh, and in that case, it would go, that right to assign the opinion would go to the senior most justice in the majority. That would be uh, Justice Thomas, Clarence Thomas. Uh, there's no question about how Clarence Thomas is going to come out on this case. He's made very clear how he's going to come out on this case. Uh, and I suspect that if he has the right to assign the opinion because the chief justice is not in the majority, he will assign it to himself. If he assigns it to himself, it will be a barn burner of opinion, of an opinion comparing Roe versus Wade to the worst embarrassments and injustices uh, and marks on the conscience of the Supreme Court going all the way back to Dred Scott against Sanford, uh, reading a, a pro-slavery uh, concept into the Constitution, to Plessy against Ferguson, to uh, the Korematsu decision in turning Japanese uh, Americans uh, with no uh, due process against their due process rights. Buck versus Bell, the embarrassing, famous uh, case in which the Supreme Court held uh, upheld the mandatory um, uh, sterilization uh, of some women. Uh, Thomas will write a barn burner, and Chief Justice Roberts knows that, and I suspect he would not want mm -hmm. such an opinion to be the opinion of the court, which would incentivize him to keep control of that opinion by joining the majority and writing a more modest, uh, less uh, inflammatory uh, opinion. Jerry, do you have a view on that? No, I, I agree. I, I think I have no doubt whatsoever that Chief Justice Roberts all along has been willing and without hesitation to join a decision upholding Mississippi's law. Uh, I rather suspect that if it turned out he were the prospective fifth vote to do so by overturning Roe, I, I think I would hedge my bets. But especially from the oral argument and a couple of exchanges between Brett Kavanaugh and actually lawyers for each side, uh, and, and leaving aside other evidence of what Brett Kavanaugh thinks and might do, from the oral argument, I've, I've come to the conclusion that Brett Kavanaugh is prepared to vote to overturn Roe. And I don't think that John Roberts uh, will hesitate to be the sixth member of that majority, even if I'm right in suggesting he would hesitate to be the fifth vote to do so. Jerry, I wish we had time uh, to go into the very interesting question to go back to the uh, uh, to the Judith Tom, uh, Thompson uh, analogy uh, with the violinist. The very interesting question of uh, the challenge that both sides now uh, put to each other coming out of uh, the debate over ma a mandatory vaccination. Uh, mm -hmm. And the question of whether you can have an imposition on somebody's body, forcing them to take a substance into their body for the sake of protecting the life, uh, the life of, right. of, uh, of somebody else. There are charges of hypocrisy uh, going both ways there that are interesting. But back to the questions we have. So Sarah uh, asks, if medical advances make it extremely possible that the mother and child could live and even the child could be separated from the, the mother early and live, then would pro-choice precedent uh, change? 
Well, we do know that uh, viability, which at the time of Roe versus Wade was at around uh, 24 weeks, the so-called uh, borderline between the so-called second and third uh, trim uh, trimesters of uh, pregnancy and gestation, uh, that's now back to 22 and maybe even a little under uh, 22 weeks in the sense that babies have survived uh, with care. Uh, before that. And there's no reason in principle to think that it can't be pushed back uh, even, even further. So as artificial amniotic fluids are developed and things like that to deal with the problem of pulmonary development, which has been the real obstacle to a uh, significant pushback of uh, fetal viability, you can have exactly the situation that Sarah is here um, uh, anticipating. Uh, that would certainly have implications for the Thompson ar ar argument. Now, it would not have implications for people uh, like Peter Singer uh, or Jeff McMahon or the typical um, uh, so-called pro-choice individual who, who argues that a uh, child before birth is, is not really a human being. Now that's scientifically um, absurd, but you still hear that. I mean, you'll still, you'll still hear people making the old Mario Cuomo <laughs> argument that we don't know if abortion is killing a human being. We don't know when, when life begins. You would think that, that, that they would take it, if not from people like you and me, from people like Peter Singer and Jeff McMahon, who obviously know what they're talking about, uh, that, that that's a really silly idea. But it's still what people in many cases say, uh, I think believe. Um, but if they uh, say and, and believe that, then the development of this technology wouldn't make any difference to them. Am I, am I right, Jerry? Yeah, I think so. And, you know, I don't know anything more than you do or our listeners do uh, about uh, Justice Barrett's question, which seemed to have hit a third rail with the uh, pro-choice lawyer. Again, even though we were colleagues for years here on the Notre Dame faculty, I, I have no inside knowledge whatsoever, but Justice Barrett did ask a question that raised, I think the, the same issue that the questioner is raising when she asked about safe harbor laws and the now realistic possibility that a baby born can be dropped off um, at a hospital or a foundling of the fire station. Yeah. And the reason why I bring it up is this, I mean, it, it did hit a third rail and I think it, it, it cut to the, to the heart of the matter uh, within the pro-choice camp and really illumined um, the difference between persons who thought of uh, abortion as simply, you might say, uh, terminating a pregnancy and those who think of abortion as really the opportunity to simply not, not be a parent Meaning, and I think this was part of the reaction, this was baked into the reaction, the hostile reaction, that it was really an, an imposition and, and, a, and a burden, an oppressive one upon a woman to make her live with the knowledge that she had a child, although given up for adoption. So this matter about um, what if the alternatives were available to make it possible to save the baby and also to save the one, that I think is really an unresolved matter uh, within the, the pro-choice camp. And I think Amy Barrett uh, kind of hit a nerve there. Uh, Jerry, Edward Jacobs uh, asks, do you believe courts should extend the Equal Protection Clause to protect the lives of the unborn? You and I are both on the record as saying yes to that question. And this gives me an opportunity, thank you, Mr. Edward Jacobs, an opportunity to uh, provide an advertisement for the uh, amicus curiae brief that uh, John Finnis of Oxford University and the University of Notre Dame and I submitted in the Dobbs case in which we make an originalist argument uh, for uh, the status of unborn human beings as persons under the 14th Amendment. We marshal um, evidence from medical as well as uh, legal uh, materials uh, from the uh, early to mid uh, 19th century. Uh, to support our claim, uh, which I actually think is a knockdown, uh, if you look at the evidence, that uh, the unborn by uh, the time of the ratification of the 14th Amendment, which includes, of course, the Equal Protection Clause, uh, by that time, uh, everyone uh, understood that uh, but we'd, we'd gotten the basic facts of human embryology, which we began which began to reveal themselves with the discovery of the mammalian ovum by von Baer in about 1827. By 1868, everybody understands that you've got a living member of the species Homo sapiens, you have a human being. They understood human beings to be persons. Nobody was holding the Singerite, McMahonite view that there's a distinction between human beings and persons and some human beings aren't persons. So uh, we think there's a knockdown uh, originalist uh, argument 
uh, not just an abstract moral argument uh, that the unborn uh, are protected by the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment properly understood. Now, what the implications of that should be for the authority of Congress and the courts of the matter is itself another debatable question. It seems to me that the, the best outcome would be for Congress acting pursuant to its Section 5 authority to enforce by appropriate legislation the guarantees of Section 1, including the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment. The ideal situation would be for Congress to uh, act there. But I think the courts would also be within their authority in uh, not completely taking over the question of abortion regulation, because there are the non-elective abortion cases, which I think have to be handled legislatively. Mm -hmm. um, life of the mother, severe threats to the health of the mother, and, and, and so forth. Mercifully rare, but nevertheless are there and I think have to be dealt with and would be properly dealt with legislatively. Not um, not by the courts. Jerry, are we on the same page there, roughly? Yeah, I mean, I agree completely that the um, the unborn count of people people begin at conception, and the Fourteenth Amendment protects any that is all persons. I should stress, for the benefit of our viewers who have not seen the brief that you did with Professor Finnis, maybe a few viewers are not even aware of it, uh, but it's available on the Supreme Court website. Um, I, I think its significance in this long-standing argument over abortion in the Constitution, I think its significance can hardly be overstated. Uh, I say, nonetheless, that it, the position you defend will not be adopted by the court in Dobbs. It's just a bridge too far. Uh, it would be leaping over, and I hesitate to say merely overruling Roe, but it would be leaping over overruling Roe and adopting what I do take to be the correct position but one that put the Constitution on the side of unborn life. I don't think the court's going to adopt it. In fact, I know it will not. Uh, I dare say it's destined um, to play a decisive role someday, um, I hope, I think. I think in Dobbs, it is not unrealistic to hope and to even to expect that a concurring opinion by one or two justices, could be Sam Alito, could be Clarence Thomas, depending on who writes the majority opinion, will take note, take the measure of the Finnis George brief, and you might say encourage the retention of the thought and the further deployment of the argument in not only lower courts, but in legislatures throughout the country. I mean, legislators, mm -hmm. every, all 50 states are under a constitutional obligation to provide equal protection of the law for all persons. So I, I say that this time around, uh, your brief is destined, I think, to be noticed. I think it will be noticed. Uh, but its importance should never, um, its perspective importance should never be limited to what judges might or might not do with it. Because especially for the foreseeable future, the fate of abortion, which means the fate of unborn children, is going to be in the hands of 50 or 51, including Congress, legislatures. And this argument should be made with great earnest and force in those legislatures, because those men and women are under this obligation, no matter what the Supreme Court says or doesn't say. For anyone uh, viewing who would like to read our brief, as Jerry said, it's available on the Supreme Court website. It is also coming out with uh, substantial uh, additional evidence uh, for, an, for a legal brief, you're, you have a word limit. Uh, for an article, you don't. So we're bringing out the brief with still more evidence supporting our fundamental claims as an article in the Harvard Journal of Law and Public Policy. Uh, so I would encourage you to look for that article, which uh, will be out soon. Again, it's um, it's by John Finnis and myself, Robert George, forthcoming in the Harvard Journal of Law and Public Policy. We're getting very near the end of our time, Jerry. Uh, J.E. Madigan, I'm uh, guessing that's my uh, friend and colleague, uh, Janet Madigan. If Roe is overturned, do you believe these questions relating to the rights and responsibilities of mothers and fathers will immediately become ripe for deeper uh, consideration? Yes, uh, yes no question about, uh, about that. I mean, I think you're going to have a lot of issues that are going to have to be handled legislatively. Now, a lot of legislatures aren't going to legislate tours, both federal and state are not going to like that. I think they have been happy with the court doing the work here and taking the responsibility and being accountable to the extent that unelected people are accountable 
legislators often want to shirk their accountability and their responsibility. This is going to put it right on their laps. Great question from J.E. Madigan. It's going to put it right on their laps. Now, let's see uh, very quickly. Um, uh, thank you. In light of this is from J.C., but I don't know. Oh, Josh, Josh. Thank you. In light of your great discussion of the philosophical aspects of personhood, could you speak to how or whether those concepts are captured in the common law or constitutional understanding of persons, particularly with respect to the unborn child? Uh, yes, I've already spoken uh, in response to another question, as has Professor Bradley, uh, to the constitutional aspect of that qu question. So uh, yes, indeed, we, we do. Um, I believe that uh, uh, as a matter of constitutional law, uh, the unborn are persons under the 14th Amendment properly interpreted. But Jerry, there's a, also a common law uh, issue here. You had common law prohibitions of abortion uh, going way back. So before we even had the modern develop the development of modern embryological science, then before the point where we really understood what was going on, when we were still stuck with the old Aristotelian uh, uh, biology. But even in the common law, my uh, recollection is that. Uh, the obligation of the state was to protect life from the first stirrings in the womb, from the first stirrings right. in the womb. So there was uncertainty and, and some error in our understanding of, of how uh, conception worked, how early embryonic development took, took place. But the concept was once you have a human life, then you've got legal protection. So whether it had the science right is a separate question. It didn't. But did it have the moral principle that continues to be embodied in our law right? That is, if you have a human being, do you need legal protection? Do you have something entitled legal protection? The answer is yes. Do you agree, Jerry? I agree completely. And, it, and it's quite remarkable, uh, not only in the history of the common law, but the history of statutory reform of the common law in the United States beginning in the mid-19th century. Uh, whenever I go back and read a secondary account of those developments by legal historians, constitutional historians, it's really quite striking and, and I suppose gratifying to see the uh, the zeal and, and rigor and commitment that was brought to bear precisely to protect unborn human persons from the moment that the evidence indicated the presence of that human individual. Um, there's a kind of unqualified uh, zealousness in this uh, reform movement um, that's that's quite quite gratifying and uh, indicates a, a, a kind of unqualified but sort of unreserved, uh, untampered um, uh, commitment to protecting the most helpless among us, and it's really uh, you know quite quite encouraging to see that. And what you do see in the statutory reform movement in the mid 19th century is a, is a, a tandem movement. Uh, you can see, I mean, this is speaking a bit metaphorically, but you can see state legislatures in the United States, you know, just at, at the minute they come to recognize more about the science and come to see that people really do begin at conception, you can see them moving immediately, immediately to change abortion law to extend the protection of abortion laws uh, all the way back to conception. And that's yeah. just an example of what I mean by this, an uncommon zeal. Yeah, uh, you, you find this documented not only in John Keown's uh, famous book, Abortions, Doctors, and the Law, uh, which is a treatment of the common law mainly focused on Britain, published by Cambridge University Press, but also in James Moore's book, uh, Abortion in America, Moore being somebody who is politically on the pro-choice uh, side, but who, to his mm -hmm. credit, uh, reports quite accurately that that it was developments in modern embryological science that led the American Medical Association to take up the cause of um, further protection for unborn life, uh, to take it all the way back to conception, which is where you have it with the 19th century statutes. Uh, before that, and before the development of modern human embryology, uh, common law jurisdictions differed in some respects. Some common law jurisdictions did not uh, prosecute abortion prior to quickening. Quickening is not viability. It's the, the period at 16, 17 weeks when a mother feels fetal movement for the, for the first time. Others, others did not have that, uh, that, that limitation. But where the limitation exists, as Keown has shown, Professor Keown of Georgetown has shown, uh, it exists because uh, pregnancy, establishing pregnancy is an element of the crime of abortion. So the prosecutor who's prosecuting the abortionist, 
not women who are prosecuted, by the way, historically uh, in America, it's abortionists. Uh, in prosecuting the abortionists, the, 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 the prosecutor has to put on evidence of pregnancy and it's the quickening that is the evidence of uh, pregnancy. Mm -hmm. Uh, we've got one more uh, question. If Justice Roberts retains, this is from Joseph Cosby. If Justice Roberts retains the ability to assign an opinion overturning Roe, why wouldn't he assign it to Justice Barrett? In that circumstance, wouldn't he rather have the opinion written by a woman, especially since Justice Barrett has shown herself to be measured in the way she writes and approaches cases? I think that's a that's a good point, and he might very well uh, he might very well do that. I think the key thing he will want to do is make sure that Justice Thomas. Uh, isn't in a position to write the opinion because Justice Thomas feels very passionately uh, about the issue and uh, especially its relation to historical injustices such as those of, of slavery and segregation perpetrated against uh, African Americans, also those against uh, disabled disabled people or putatively or allegedly disabled people as in the case of Buck versus Bell or other uh, ethnic minorities as in the Korematsu case denying, uh, de depriving uh, innocent Japanese and Japanese Americans of their due process rights and putting them in internment camps in World War uh, World War II. Uh, Nicholas uh, Marr has very uh, kindly provided a brief, uh, I'm sorry, a link to our brief, a link to the amicus curiae brief that I did with John Finnis. It's up in the chat. I think you can, you can copy that so you'll have it when the um, session closes. Uh, Nicholas, thank you for doing that, and thank you for the opportunity to uh, appear under the auspices of the Federalist uh, Society. And above all, my thanks to my dear longtime friend, uh, Jerry Bradley, for, as always, his illuminating uh, discussion of important issues. Thank you, Jerry. You're welcome. Pleased to do it. Good night. Thank you all very much. On behalf of the Federalist Society, I'll give our customary thanks. Uh, thank you both very much for taking the time out of your busy schedules to participate in what I think was a really terrific discussion. Thanks very much to our listeners uh, for hanging in there, sticking a little bit afterwards, and for your great questions. Um, thank you very much for your engagement. Uh, this will be posted as a podcast uh, probably within the week up on the website, so do check that out. And of course, check your emails on our website for announcements about upcoming events uh, just like this one. So with that, until next time, thank you all very much. We are adjourned. Thank you, Nick.